Has everyone got their notes up in front of them? Is everyone ready to do some podcasting? I think si, so. Senor. I'm never quite ready, but yeah. Nah, that's the best way to come into one of these. <laughs> so I've fully prepared. Yeah. Right. Can we make that the motto for the podcast? <laughs> never fully prepared. Hello and welcome back to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jesse Billington. And as ever, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, the itchy label to my cheap t-shirt, Timo Albus Daly, and the silk lining to my dinner jacket, Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you both? A little offended that you keep short shafting me like that, but I'll get over it. It, it. it pushes my creative writing every week to find a slightly different way of portraying you as you ought to. And, and yet somehow Ellie Mae gets a nicer billing every time. <laughs> Yeah, well, she is nicer, so I think it's only fair that it's that's accurately reflected. Yeah, I feel a little bit smug, but I'm also good. I mean, apart from tomorrow, I don't have to go back to work until the 4th of July. Oh, very nice. Mm. Any particular reason? Of... Just, Independence uh, Day. Yeah, uh, I just had a lot of holiday to use up. Oh, very, very nice indeed. So you're going to spend that with the latest update of Ellie Mae's rash corner. Yes. No fun facts, but we've got rashes. <laughs> Another one, a new one. For for new listeners to the podcast, we should point out that previously we have had a section on this podcast dedicated to tracking the growth and development of a series of rashes Ellie Mae had. And we've got another one, so that's fine. It's, it's a been fun. a dull F1 season, we know, but oh. it's, it's gone to yeah. this length already. We've got to find something to talk about that's not Max Verstappen's dominancy, so Ellie Mae's rashes are the, the talk of the town. Which also makes it sound really gross, and I just want to clarify that one of them was a, a kind of a big allergic reaction to antibiotics. The second one is um, sticky weed. Am yeah, it, you're not just getting weird rashes because you're some sort of medical yeah. freak. They're generally just sort of the sort of rash you'd pick up if you just touch grass every now and then, I suppose. Um, we'll move straight on from Ellie Mae's rash corner to... Uh, we're back to talk about all the action from the Canadian Grand Prix, and we'll take a look at some of the news that's come out of the world of Formula One in the past week as well. So with that in mind, we're going to launch straight into what the hell has happened. And I think the headline news off the weekend is it's now 100 wins for Red Bull, a century, a centurion of wins. Uh, the big question is, though, we've got the new little section, Jesse's Big Question. Uh, this one have, was ghostwritten for me by Ellie Mae Taylor. What's your favourite Red Bull win? Mine is Danny Rick's Monaco win in 2018. I didn't actually get to watch the race live, and perhaps that's why it's a happier memory for me, because for other people, the race itself was fairly boring, but... Ricardo dominated the entire weekend. He was the fastest in all three practices, went on to get pole, was leading the race, and he suffered an MGUK failure, which gave him about 25% less power, about sort of early-ish into the race. I think it was about a quarter of the way through. And I remember my dad messaging me saying, he's leading the race, but he's got an issue. And the entire time I was then on my phone, refreshing the race update page that I was on, constantly feeling incredibly nervous that he was going to lose this win but obviously because it's Monaco and it's hard to overtake he kept the win and it's for two reasons really why this is my favorite win because obviously it was redemption for when Red Bull missed, messed up his pit stop in 2017 meaning he lost the lead of the race and secondly growing up I'd kind of been a Ferrari fan but I'd never followed F1 too seriously and when Danny Rick and Max Verstappen joined Red Bull I would say that was where my when my real love for F1 started and it got a bit more serious. So I guess in, it's personal in terms of emotion as well. And it was I know it, that was sort of the race coming to the end of end of that duo at Red Bull and it was the last win they got for the team. But I just remember it with such fond memories that for me, I think it's my favourite race, either that or Abu Dhabi 2020, because I feel like we didn't really think much of Verstappen's win. It was just the last race of the season. We thought, oh, yeah, Hamilton's going to get his eighth title the year after. And it just kind of foreshadowed the incredible season we then got in 2021. It was sort of the start of something really special. Yeah, I think the 2020 win is definitely an interesting one because it was that sort of the premonition, that sort of foresight to 
oh look red bull didn't do too badly there oh <laughs> they really didn't do too badly there um yeah it was very sort of early doors warning as to what what was to come um i contemplated putting 2021 as my favorite red bull win but i think that'd be a kind of reductive everyone knows that i was there and enjoyed it as a weekend and b i don't think it's their greatest win ever simply because of the circumstances you can't yeah they played a blinder of a strategy and it fell into their hands but that's certainly not come off of red bull's back as such it's more the championship that, that in that instance stands more as red bull's thing I would have to say for my favourite Red Bull win, uh, Seb Vettel 2013, Multi 21 in Malaysia. I think I'm certain that was a race win for them as well because they swapped positions for the race win, wasn't it? Yeah, um, that's you deciding, I'm not going to go for a controversial race, I'll go for a different controversial race. <laughs> yes, yeah, but equally, this is a controversial race that it defines what Red Bull is as a team, and certainly the team we know in the present day, at least a decade down the line. It's a team that's ruthless and determined and will do what it needs to do to favour one driver often. And it's very much a vibe that sort of followed out through the ensuing decade. Obviously, after the Seb dominancy period, they sort of struggled to find their feet between the two Dannys, and then obviously they swapped one Danny for Max, and then things obviously took a bit of a turn. There was a slight fraught period between Max and Danny as to which one was going to be the number one driver. Danny didn't want to have to face the music on that one left. And we then obviously saw Max become the number one driver against um, Gasly and then against Albon. And I think now we're seeing sort of very much... The... Fiat again briefly now? Um... It gets a bit confusing, that whole period. I feel like there was a third driver in there somewhere. I can't remember. I don't think <laughs> it's hard ever... to keep track at this point. <laughs> I don't think Max ever teammated Danny Kvyat. I think he might. No, because yeah. they simply swapped. Uh, literally, no, went swapped. down to no, okay. Kvyat was back. That was all because he'd been Kvyat away. left and then came back again to teammate Gasly at Toro Rosso. But yeah, it was that sort of. If you want a race that defines Red Bull, I think Malaysia 2013 Multi 21 has to be that race. Really, I remember it. I... Well, just for the fact that I was, for some reason, I was sat on the floor right in front of the TV. And my mum is a huge Mark Webber fan. And she was livid at what Seb had done. So it was quite like understandable. <laughs> yeah. Timo, your favourite Red Bull win? I wasn't 100% sure, so I've got two and I'll keep it brief. Either Silverstone 2010 with Weber, he was dominant, but the race behind him was also very entertaining as well. And it was just kind of a showing again that he does have what it takes to be at the front of that team. It's, it's not always just about Vettel or Canada 2014 with Ricardo, because I had thought about Monaco, but obviously Ellie May already took that. Um, and as Canada 2014 was his first win, and that was also a race, not from his perspective, but from a few other perspectives as well. And you had some interesting things going on there. And in hindsight, when you see how dominant the season is going to become, these other victories from uh, some other teams, primarily Red Bull, were very rare. So for Ricardo to be able to get in between that, even though Mercedes did have a couple of issues, it was good to see him be able to do that and for him to be better in the process. Mm. It was sort of one of those moments where you go, okay, they can also roll the dice fairly and they've got... This they've got nothing to, to lose, everything yeah. to gain, and you might as well try it which is something they've often sort of done. They've thrown that caution to the wind and gone, we have nothing to prove. We aren't just an energy drinks manufacturer. What have we got to prove here? And that's something that someone picked up on that Christian Horner constantly says in interviews, oh yeah, we're just an energy drinks manufacturer. And he came out, he said, the reason I keep saying that is because it really annoys sort of the OEMs, the original engineering manufacturers, on the grounds of their big car brands, you've been Mercedes, your Ferraris, your Aston Martins, your McLarens, your Alfa Romeos, it annoys them that they're being shown up by an Austrian company that stole the idea for an energy drink off the tie. And that's that's pretty much where it stems from. And it's it's just crazy that essentially an over over expanded marketing ploy for a very sugary drink with a lot of caffeine in it has gotten to the point that it's now dominating the foremost level of motorsport. Equally as impressive, though, Verstappen matches Senna's wins, um, both of them now on to 41 wins, I think I'm correct to say that's the number. Yeah. 
41 wins and equally uh, Max has now led every lap of the season since lap 48 of the Miami Grand Prix there has not been a race lap in a Grand Prix since Miami that Max Verstappen has not led that is 224 of them consecutively he's now won six of the eight contested Grand Prix this season as a driver, Max has more points than Mercedes does as a constructor. And if you take all of the constructors from Ferrari backwards, Max is just 14 points shy of their cumulative points haul. Um, the same concept for every driver from Charles backwards. They have 178 points. So where do we see this dominancy going for the rest of the season? Do we think he's just going to clean sweep the rest of it? Do we think, and crucially, do we think there's going to be a race that Max cannot win this year? I think it all depends on how early he wraps up the title and how much after that he gives a shit <laughs> about winning anything. I mean, you kind of you didn't see a dip in quality after he wrapped up the title last year, but you saw him less fussed, I think, overall. But then also weirdly fussed about certain things. Hence Brazil, for example. And I suppose it depends on how much Aston Martin and Mercedes can develop between now and the end of the season, because I don't think either of them realistically think they can catch Red Bull this season to do anything about it. But they obviously are playing the long game and they've got each other to fight. So I'm not sure if everything, I mean, we still haven't seen any real reliability issues unless you can Perez as a liability um, for them not winning a race. So I suppose, unless you get a kind of a Monza or kind of mad, crazy, wet race at some somewhere like Brazil or Singapore or Hungary, nothing really. <laughs> I've kind of written it off as we just assume he wins and it's just we watch everything else blind, which is a shame because if you look at the podium from this weekend, you've got the three world champions up there. If this was a season, oh, could you imagine the fights those three could be having? But instead we have to just sit here and somehow be disappointed with that podium. Yeah, we have to be disappointed with one of the most championship-rich podiums you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a strange one. I don't think there isn't there is a race that Mark Max can't win this season, really. I think at the moment he's just in a league of his own. He's consistently sort of managing the pace. You've got to think, yes, there was a smaller gap this weekend between him and Fernando, but I think he was just managing the pace. He wasn't particularly pushing and critically. He had a dead seagull stuck in his car. So that must have had some form of effect on his performance, but and it I wasn't quite as big as a seagull. It was sort of more like a Ren Robin size thing. But Red Bull, weirdly enough, I don't know if it was Red Bull or someone sort from the Red Bull team leaked the picture, but one of the mechanics did fish it out of, I think it was still trapped in the front wing. And it was sort of just like a little brown jobby sort of bird. But yeah, it was pretty They take it back to the pet shop and try and get a refund. And it was just told, no, it's resting, it's stunned. It, it, this parrot is deceased, I'm afraid. Um, Either way, I think, you know, that would have cost some performance. And still no one could really catch him yes Alonso had rear brake issues as well but I think the pack is tightening up somewhat but I don't think they're on Max's level yet I guess I think it's almost my question is how quickly is he going to match Vettel's wins of 53 how many races are left this season <laughs> it's doable it's doable that's the thing I think he <laughs> is going to become <laughs> the most dominant Red Bull driver to have ever driven in the spate of a season where he overtakes Senna, Prost and Vettel for wins. It's it's going to happen. I think if we're going to see one specific race where the Red Bull struggles, it's going to be like an ultimately very challenging and tricky circuit that's tight and does I not... prefer the really irony of being Zandvoort that he doesn't win, just I'd because like, it'd be amusing at this point. The irony of Zandvoort would be good, but I think it's going to be something like Singapore because it's that sort of tight demanding, all it takes is a bit of a wet qualifying for someone else to end up on pole and it's a tricky circuit to overtake round. Max did all right there last year, trying to fight his way back through the field after a messed up qualifying. I don't think Perez is on quite the same form as he was last year to really battle and get the win or the pole he needs around that circuit this year. So it could be up to someone else. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see Ocon on the podium for Singapore. But yeah, I think that's that's the way it's going is Singapore is possibly the only race that has a shadow over it. Everything else, I wouldn't be surprised if Max robs home to a 10 second win. The thing is, even in the rain, he's good. He's good in the rain. There is no sort of, what do they say? No. There's no chink in his armor. Chinks in his armor. There's yeah, no flaws that, to his yeah. perfection. 
I suppose the one awkward thing we could just throw out there before we move on is that if the Monza curse continues, then theoretically they he can't win Monza because he won it last year, and by default he will DNF. Yeah, so which is the only hope we have at this point. I mean, trust him to screw up that statistic as well. But if we want to put a picking on something, we're going to have to put on that. It's possible. Let's not rule it out. Um, speaking of win- big wins, big numbers, and sheer dominancy, Adrian Newey is apparently this makes his two hundredth win or the win two hundredth win of a car of his design and creation. Um, he's actually the most successful person on the grid and on the um, podium with 11 world championships and essentially 12 world titles. So you've got 92, 93 as doubles, 94 is just a constructor, 96, 97, 98, 99 as a driver, 2010, 11, 12, 13 as driver and constructors, 21 as a driver and 2022 back to form of both driver and constructor titles. It's kind of a tricky one to pin down because it depends on the transitional periods as he moves between teams, what work is still his on the car, what work becomes his on another car. Um, But generally speaking, it's sort of taken as 11 world championship wins and 12 drivers titles. That is a phenomenal statistic. And that's more than Hamilton, Alonso and Verstappen combined. If he was a constructor, he'd be one of the most successful. And yeah, when it comes to sort of that overall win number of 200, it is tricky to try and pin down because of the team transitions, gardening leave and so on. But I think there's not many other engineers, mechanics, team principles that you tend to think of in Formula One. There are a few big names that always stand out across the decades, but Adrian Newey is one that has been standout since the 90s. I don't think there's anyone else that's achieved that level of notoriety in Formula One outside of the drivers. I think. It's also worth mentioning that he pretty much hit the ground running when he joined Williams in 1991. I mean, the FW14 had already been been made and Patrick Head, head of engineering, believed the Renault V10 engine was a very good engine, but it was the aerodynamics letting them down. They, they hired Newey as chief designer and he set about proving the FW14 to become one of the most incredible and my favourite F1 car the FW14B, and he didn't want to look at just innovating one area. They needed to create a full cohesive package from front front wing to rear, and it had to be as slim as possible, which also meant trying to create an aerodynamically efficient car first and then fit the internal structure within that. And luckily, Patrick Head was on board with this, so he designed sort of the transverse gearbox to suit the aerodynamics and the radiators were built sort of vertically and inclined rearwards to allow the airflow to diffuse properly along the inlet duct. And it created a bigger fuel tank to feed that powerful Renault engine without sort of lengthening the chassis at all, for instance. And it meant that in some ways, Nigel Mansell was Nui's blessing and a curse because Nui wanted to create this really slimline car, but Nigel had big hips and also he needed to fit in the car. So they made the car around him. But when they had but where they had created sort of such a powerful car that had tremendous downfalls, because we knew he also created the active suspension on this car as well. The fact that Mansell also had superb upper body strength meant he had the power behind him to really drive the car. And that's why he was able to sort of have that advantage over Ricardo Patrice and was able to win the 90, 1992 championship with five races to go. And it has to be one of the most technology technologically advanced cars that we've seen in F1. And that was the first championship winning car that he designed. It's truly make crazy and mind blowing what that man can do. And I'm unsure we will ever find someone quite like him. I think he just must see air particles moving. His, his eyesight must just be so incredible because then what he then joined McLaren and the one in the first year that he was with them as well. Yeah, he sees in aero flow. And I think when he when he mentioned this whole the whole sort of brawn of the Renault V10 in that early Williams and the fact that it matched up so perfectly with the design of the car, the structure of the car, and equally the driver behind the wheel in Nigel Mansell, the fact that he was able to then extract that dominance over Patrese was the key element to it. And it was it was a match made in heaven. It gave Newey this chance to hit the ground running, go, okay, that works, and then immediately start developing. He never had to sort of take a backward step and go, that didn't work, what will? It was always a case of, oh, that worked, and then keep going. I think to be able to even get the very first, 
that worked there was never a doubt in his mind it was that is going to work he is an incredibly intelligent man i think that that's definitely shown in the way that pretty much every team apart from when he joined the sport and i cannot remember for the life of me what that first team was when he joined um i'm gonna to have to google it now that's gonna really annoy me if i don't know hey adrian newey who did he join was f1 not. with was he wasn't he it I don't was know march and leighton which later became leighton house yeah which was a uh, rough going times. I think they had like the likes of Ivan Capelli driving for them. It was an all right driver lineup, but the chassis was never going to be there. They were essentially glorified privateers. But the fact that he was able to sort of go, okay, right, I know exactly how this spec of car works, and then immediately jump into Williams and go, right, here's what we're going to do. And knowing that that's going to have the success was key. And yeah, it's just the fact that when you think of people outside drivers in Formula One, you perhaps think of um yeah you, you your brain immediately goes to newey perhaps of the modern era you go to your christian horn as your toto wolves if you think back a little bit further you think back to that sort of ferrari heyday where you look at um jean todd there you go he's one of those names that was sort of so interwoven within the sport in the same way because of the sort of role he had within the fia but equally the fact that he was so crucial to that dominancy we saw through ferrari it's sort of one of those few names outside of the pool of drivers that you immediately go, ah, that name, that means Formula One. I think Newey, for years to come, is going to be that person. He was asked over the weekend, when does it end? And he said, I don't know. I think we're counting down to it, but I don't know when that's counting down to. With that in mind, though, is it not his responsibility as someone who could go into a team and do this kind of stuff for charity purposes, if for nothing else, to go and fix Ferrari? <laughs> just so fix them. Make th- it doesn't have to be perfect. Just make them competitive enough that they can just sort out a couple of issues on the car and then he can leave and be like, thank you. The thank you. Ferrari's engineering has never been the problem. Yeah. It's, it's not back to Williams and use kind of to have like a really kind of use the 20 year old technology they've got to the advantage and you manage to just create something out of that he does a scrap heap challenge with it and just bang williams is back up to speed then and then he can leave i don't think he even wants to do that i think he wants to sort of get to his his absolute precipice and go right there we are that's all i've got and then he's gonna go back to bidding jaguars around goodwood i think that's gonna be he's done it before he's been to gt40 around there he made an absolutely fantastic e-type the other year that i think jensen button raced in for a members meet and like his knowledge and understanding of what makes a car go fast around a corner is so highly transferable that when he goes to sort of retire as such and goes into the world of classic racing, there will be classic race teams and privateers that are going, you would mind just having a quick look at the suspension on my Austin Healy, would you? I think I've, I think I've got it just about right. And it's He's going to be a, a very interesting person to sort of speak to in fields outside F1 as the years roll by. It'd be interesting to see what he could do if he went to IndyCar and started doing their spec cars. That would be fantastic. It's, I guess also as well as the fact that Obviously, it's not completely all down to him, but Williams haven't won a champions, championship since, since he's gone. McLaren have only won the one since he's left. Yeah. So he must feel pretty great that there it's is almost... a magic that follows him, that's for certain. Yeah. Speaking of places where there isn't magic, Ellie Mae Taylor. Well, not specifically you, but you've got <laughs> the story for this one. Thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was unfortunately announced last week that W Series had gone into administration. And I firstly just want to say W Series didn't fail. The lack of funding and support for those who, from those who could have kept it running failed it. Their support race at the British Grand Prix was the second most watched motorsport event since Sky and Motorsport Records began. Whilst people may not have agreed with the idea of an all-female series, we needed it in order to allow women's racing to shine, because no matter what area of motorsport women are trying to get into, they have to work 10 times harder, yet probably with less support. And I can contest to that, not, not as a driver, but as a getting into the media for the fact that I largely get ignored at most motoring events I go to. But... W Series wasn't just about allowing the current generation of female drivers to race or work behind the scenes. It gave women a platform to inspire the next generation of little girls, because if you can see it, you can believe it. And 
Annie Thompson, uh, we posted a picture on her Instagram story of this little girl at the British Grand Prix sat in front of a big screen watching W Series go around on the circuit. And that was a ser- what the series was all about. And I really hope it's a case of W Series walked so F1 Academy can run and that, an all- and that females can then see a clear path, whether that's a driver, an engineer in the media or even a team principal. You know, we're here to break the glass ceiling. I think definitely with W Series, it it no longer exists, but the legacy that it's left has been crucial. Yeah. And there are a lot of drivers who had been part of the series that came out and said, had it not been for W Series, I wouldn't be racing in whatever I'm racing in now. I think that is the big crucial thing, is the fact that it reignited so many people's careers, either behind the wheel, behind the microphone, or other people's careers behind the toolbox in on the pit wall. It triggered and restarted a lot of careers and equally started a lot of careers it's had the positive impact that it sort of needed to it was that spark in the tinderbox that's given us the sort of familiar faces of sort of more and more women bobbing around the f1 paddock obviously we mentioned it a few weeks back the fact that we sort of occasionally spot sort of pit crew members in i know alpine and Haas have got them that are sort of female members of the team you sort of go huh but then equally over years, that's over the years since W series began, that's almost become normal. And that is, if anything, the goal of what it was aiming to be was to normalize that and make that just a commonplace thing. And well, case in point with that in particular, there was a woman I interviewed well, a long time ago now in the rest of things, um, back when she was just becoming a W series mechanic, Claire Collins. And now I think one Spanish Grand Prix, I want to say, you actually saw her in our, the Alpine garage working there. And as she was saying when I interviewed her back in 2021 or whenever that she wanted to be an F1. And I was like, yeah, you've been able to do that because of W Series. And it shows, like you were saying, it's not just the drivers, it's all the people behind the scenes and all the various different roles there that are equally important. You can't go racing without them. Mm, there's It's all the extra support elements that it's generated this interest in, this understanding in in essentially a 50% of the population that otherwise would, would have been completely blind to. And I think it's it's definitely done a fantastic job in that, and it certainly cannot be forgotten for the effort it put in. Yes, it had its flaws in the fact that the first series was tricky to try and find and watch, and the fact that it never actually followed F1. But once it found its feet and once it actually sort of got itself into gear, it was revolutionary and had a massive impact. And um, But equally, it's also served as a highlighter to show where those holes still are. The reason that it failed is still a very or failed in inverted commas rather, is still a useful tool to look at and go, right, these are the bits that we now know we need to focus on. It's the sort of the same principle as when uh, planes came back from World War II. You didn't look at where the the ones that came back had been shot at. You reinforce the areas that are, are sort of this, you look at the converse of sort of the planes that survive. You don't enforce the bits where they were fine to get shot at. You look at the bits where the planes that didn't come back from failed. And that's where you look for your failure rates. And you need something to fail to learn from. And that's where W Series is, if anything, been its greatest success in its failure almost. So we move on from. More, just need more support. Yeah, in the fact that it just needs more support. It needs that financial backing to it that female racing series and female racing drivers never get. It is critically underfunded because people just don't want to put their money there, which is strange considering a lot of attention, especially if you put it onto the likes of the one female driver in a series, they're always going to get singled out because of the fact that they are that number one. That's always going to garner more rise than anything else. And it's weird that no one ever sort of cons onto that one. We'll move on from... And and the frustrating thing that if we had the funds, we would have happily supported it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But I barely have the funds to support myself. So I think priority numero uno there is making sure that I'm still alive. So um, selfish, Jesse. So selfish. I know. I know. If I could, I would. But unfortunately, I do prioritize myself over the existence of Abby Pulling's racing career. Um, move on to Italy has moved to block a Chinese state owned company from taking control of tire making giant Pirelli. Uh, the decision is part of measures announced by Italy's government to protect Pirelli's independence. Beijing controlled chemical giant Sinochem is Pirelli's biggest shareholder with a 37% stake in the 151 year old Milan based firm. I believe this is a point that Timo jotted down, but he's simply just walked away from the Zoom call at this point in time. So we're going to take it at face value from sort of the headline he's jotted down. And it's interesting because there's constant tyre talks in Formula One about 
who's going to be tyre suppliers for years to come. We've mentioned it uh, the other uh, week on the sort of Bridgestone having a, a look at putting together a contract and it upping sort of Pirelli's idea to, well, I suppose you want to actually put together something proper this year. So it's certainly interesting that Italy has such a sort of significant stakeholder in it as well, but we'll see how that progresses and move into the actual race weekend where fp1 was dominated by a lack of cctv cameras around the circuit uh, there was simply a some sort of tech failure that meant that race control couldn't actually see anything that was happening on track beyond the tv coverage and that wasn't enough so most of what we saw on the tellies at home was dedicated to groundhogs and fp2 was extended to make up for the lack of running um, we moved on then after the practice sessions to qualifying which was damp to start with inters being the dominant tire early on but as the track evolution kicked in and the tarmac dried out a clever williams capitalized on that sending albon out to bag p1 on the soft before the rain fell again and no one was able to challenge his time a wet q3 saw edgy running and a surprise hass of hulkenberg in p2 however a chaos in the rain and miscommunication up and down the field saw a lot of blocking on track. Science, Stroll, Sonoda all received three place grid penalties, though Science was in a world of his own with the penalties from. What do we think about how that went down? He deserved it. Everyone was guilty of something in that one, so at least he didn't get away with it. He was dawdling around that final chicane, and I think if he hadn't dawdled, was it Yuki Sonoda then sort of flew past him? He wouldn't have then got stuck behind him going around the chicane, which then hindered Gansley. Hmm. So he should have just really got a move on. Because haven't he done it previously as well? As it maybe in a free practice or something? I'm not too sure when. It's definitely when... happened recently with science. There's been sort of this thing of Ferrari just not telling their drivers what's actually happening behind them on track and especially in the rain with the tiny little jiggly mirrors on f1 cars you're going to see melt you're going to have no clue of what's coming up behind you so that's where you're relying on your um your engineers on the pit wall your spotters around the circuit to sort of tell you what on earth is going on and ferrari just didn't bother doing that with science and had to pay the price unfortunately However, obviously, we had the uh, grid place penalties handed out, and that led us into the race itself. Throughout the race, obviously, we saw pretty much uh, Verstappen do his usual thing of disappear off into the distance and leaving behind him Hamilton and Alonso in a tight battle. Alonso battling brake issues and possibly excessive brake wear, so using lift and coast for majority of the race, actually. It seemed to kick in quite early on, so he was fighting against his car for a significant part of the race but was still able to keep Hamilton behind part of being a wily old campaigner is a phrase that uh, Crofty loves to throw out there um, Russell clattered into the wall on the exit of the turns 8 and 9 chicane too much curb bounced his car through the air sliding wide on exit into the wall cracked a wheel rim so we saw him limp back home with pretty much sort of one tyre actually fell off as he came into the pit lane and the fry mechanic ran out and grabbed it for the Red Bull team and there is a man in a Small helicopter coming overhead. You can probably even pick that up a microphone. Just wait for him to go away. Yeah, so Russell had to pit for some repairs and was sent back out and sat at the back of the field, uh, but was still on the lead lap under safety car, so was able to actually catch up to the field and not suffer too badly there, and fought his way back through the field, but was eventually caught behind Alex Albon. Uh, the problem is, though, sat in the dirty air, the overheating down the right-hand side of his car as a result of it slamming into the wall, eventually forced a retirement for the Mercedes driver after running in the dirty air of that Williams ahead of him. Ferrari ran long and made a risky strategy work, which is very un-Ferrari in Formula One these days. They utilised the safety car of Russell's, Russell's crash to gain vital track position, signs battling with Perez early on, but otherwise they were well behaved and kept things in order. Science points haul against the retired Russell sees the Spaniard jump the Brit in the standings as well. And then we get on to Alex Albon, driver of the day. Wow, we he made those tyres do the most at the end of that race, defending off George behind and he until he dropped out and Ocon caught up. Not an easy fight to do, especially in a Williams that's only just started major development from essentially last season. If the team can make the most of this and keep up the momentum, then we might see the fight at the back of the field spice up. Though in the bigger picture, they are still a long way off the lead with Red Bull already focusing energy and resources on their 2024 competitor his points haul cannons him up to 12th place in the standings though norris in his uh in 11th is five points ahead of him 
Elbon just needs some more decent weekends to keep ahead of Hulkenberg, who's just a point behind. Haas have historically gone well at the Red Bull ring, but the high speeds of the circuit could favour the Williams this year. This also marks Williams' highest finishing position since the Spa Grand Prix in 2021. But if we only go by contested GPs that have gone the full distance, then the race prior in Hungary saw Latifi bag P7. The last time the Grove outfit outscored or scored higher than P7 rather was 2017, where Lance Stroll bagged P6 in Mexico. We're approaching a decade on since the team were fighting uh, for constructors' titles in 2014 and 15, where they came home third to Red Bull and Ferrari, respectively. I hope we're going to see them stop licking their wounds of the past few seasons, dust themselves off and get on with taking the fight back to the top. Aston Martin are proving that a customer team with a good driver, which I've no doubt Alex is, can take the fight to a constructor. Yeah, Alex is just knocking it out of the park and again showing that if you don't have Red Bull syndrome of having to live up to Max Verstappen and you can be left to your own devices for a bit to just breathe then you might actually be all right with these things. And it was a shame we couldn't see more from Sargent this weekend as well to see what he could have done in that car because he's getting a lot of flack and I feel like it's a bit undeserved considering it's his rookie season and we're only just nearly halfway through the first season and he's had just a bit of bad luck on his side as well. So I think you've got a lot of potential there and James Vowles has been very open with how dated some of the technology is shall we say on that car and what they need to do to improve in the future so it does seem a little bit like they're doing the best they can with what they've got and if you just give them a little bit more then who knows what they'll be capable of and it does kind of strike me a bit of force india back whenever the hell they were i kind of lose the years at this point because of how many names that team's had i want to say around 2017 2016 time 16, 17, um, of 18. kind of having a shoestring-ish budget, but managing to pull out some really good performances out of it. And knowing that you're not going to be able to do that week in, week out, but there will be some tracks. And that number is increasing a bit now, as we've seen if we compare over the last few years, to, okay, maybe it's only one or two more a year, but one or two more a year where you at least have the potential to fight or you try these risky strategies like in Australia 2022, for example, why not try it? You've got nothing to lose anyway. And some teams like Alfa Romeo and Haas should maybe, I'm not even going to bother with Alfa Romeo because they're in a whole league of their own in the wrong way of things. Um, they should take a leaf out of Williams' book and just be a bit more throw everything at the wall and see what happens because what's the worst that's going to happen, you're not going to get points again anyway. So try it and you might get P7. I really questioned when Jos Caboto left because I thought, is that really what Williams needs? They kind of need stability. I didn't think Yacht had really done that bad of a job. But actually, I think it was a really good move, especially getting James Bowles in, because sort of like you touched upon, he's got that experience in Mercedes that he can bring and say, you're doing this, like you're behind with your sort of equipment or whatever by like, however many years but he had that has that knowledge and experience to tell them that and he can get them to a better place whilst I think if they had just kept to the way that they were doing things they may not have had the sort of improvements that they've really been having this this season so far I think there's an interesting comparison to make with McLaren as well of they their strategy seems to be let buy as many people and items and sponsors as we can and throw them all at the car and hope something works. Whereas I was essentially thinking, okay, yes, we need to make improvements, but also let's do a really, really detailed stock check and see how we can use all of this old technology to our advantage here and see how much we can eke out of everything so that when we do get to spend the money that we do have, we're absolutely using it critically and it's going to give us some improvements. And I think... If we hark back to Bahrain at the start of the year, Albon was saying, everyone's so focused on Aston Martin. Yes, it's such a great job they've done. But I think we're not far behind them in terms of the biggest jump that they've made. It's just taking a bit more time for that to be realised. But a couple more weekends like this, and it'd be interesting again to see if we can get Sargent up there as well, through either just being able to finish a race through no fault of his own, or being able to just capitalise on some good strategy, then or having a crazy race, Monza potentially, then... It could be, I really wanted to get over 
Hess and Alfa Romeo in the constructors at the very least, and McLaren is not terribly far up the road either. So that would be that's my goal for this year. I, I we need something to be exciting, and we know it's not going to be first place. So I'm going to go for Williams to go for that P6 in the standings constructors. So let's make that happen, and I'll go and absolutely lose my nut if it does. Does anyone else got anything else to sort of chuck onto the points I had from earlier as well? Because I know I sort of whistle stop my way through the Grand Prix. There wasn't a great deal to go over bar Russell's crash, which was just sloppy. I was ranking the Grand Prix in comparison to the other ones this season. I think I've put it in like third place so far, but at the same time, that's only because the bar is incredibly low for this year. And I'm just, it's such a disjointed season that it's kind of, oh, it's, yeah, there's not really much going for it. And it's a shame because you see Alonso on the podium for the first time in years consistently. And you see Aston Martin doing this massive leapfrog Mercedes on the bounce back. We have a podium like this, like I was saying earlier. And yet I'm struggling to get excited for it because it just seems a bit eh. So I don't mind you whistling through the Grand Prix as such because aside from Albon, there wasn't really much else going on, despite what F1 would have you believe. Like, what a race, man. was it? Were we were watching something else? Were you watching the IndyCar at Road America? Because that, that was exciting. We enjoyed that. But that, that was, was that was several hundred overtakes in one race. That was something incredible. That was normal IndyCar. Pro- <laughs> that was yeah, that's normal IndyCar. I need to go back and properly dig through it. I've only seen snippets of pieces here and there. I usually absolutely sort of revel in it, but unfortunately it was the times clashed because they're both essentially coming from the same time zone. So they both sort of ran into each other on the scheduling. But yeah, it's just we're having Grand Prix this season where there's little bits to take away from, but you've got to be me you've got to be really overly analytical and sort of dig through them to find the points sort of come away from it and go wasn't this exciting one person goes i guess if for you exciting is hamilton duking out with alonso for second it's not exactly the race win and even the duking out nature of that wasn't too much of a duke it wasn't a lot of you think duking out you think maybe hamilton rosberg bahrain or leclerc and uh, Verstappen in Saudi that's duking it out whereas this was like he's getting near him he's getting up uh, uh, no he's, he's getting, getting near close, him he's getting close uh, 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 no yeah. that was kind of the point that I wanted to make and sorry maybe it was um, maybe I'm kind of like Jesse in this and I find perhaps to other people weird things quite interesting in that I would like to I'd have liked to have seen all the lap times near the end that Verstappen, Alonso and Hamilton were doing because obviously Hamilton um, was then closing in on Alonso and then fell back but the gap had widened between Verstappen and Alonso so was it that Hamilton was getting slower or that both Verstappen and Alonso were doing quicker lap times but Verstappen was going a little bit quicker than Alonso to create a sort of a second more gap mm, it's i don't know i think there was obviously hamilton and alonso were battling and battling faster than the field behind them but i think verstappen was just sort of being kept aware of it and just putting in that little bit more each time because he knows exactly how much he can demand from the car and exactly how to extract just that little bit of lap time we saw him do it in spain where he just sort of nonchalantly went for the fastest lap and then was like cool that's good I'll just hold the gap to the guy behind now and I think Verstappen knows that he's got that ability to just sort of go oh there's something going on behind me better just leave them space and that speaks testament to the sort of superlative nature of the Red Bull and his driving this season but otherwise it it's not leaving for a a particularly exciting season i think it is potentially the, it's on par for becoming the dullest season i've ever watched and when you again look at the people we've got on the podium this weekend i don't know how that works because it on paper it looks exciting and then you watch the race and you're like oh never mind <laughs> see i still really liked it Maybe- I liked it, but because but what are, what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to other races this season or if one in general? Because if it's other races this season, the bar is like minusculely low. Because <laughs> I get, I I agree with you about the quali- the qualifying laps, the essentially qualifying laps towards the end of the race between the top three. That I did enjoy seeing the fastest lap go back and forth and seeing that gap go all the time. But I feel like 
that shouldn't be the main attraction. You should you shouldn't be able to have time to focus on that because there's too much actual action happening between drivers on track. And for a new generation of cars where you're supposed to be getting much more overtaking, we seem to have had a lot more DRS trains this season. It's like, okay, so why are we only getting close again? Why are we not actually getting closer racing, but we're not getting overtaking? I have to admit, I did have a lot of thoughts during that race. Like, instead of action in my notes instead of action going on i've instead put like on lap 54 i was like how ferrari did a one-stopper mm, like those are my thoughts we're having, we're kind of having max and fernando race. time to think in the car whilst we're going around <laughs> like oh lance is doing well on that overtake on this corner no no focus on the driving <laughs> Yeah, the, the way you're engaging with the race is the same way that Max is when he's going, is that Helmut Marco's phone going off in the back of my mm. radio calls? Like, you've got so much extra thinking capacity to sort of go, I recognise that noise. Oh, yeah, that's Helmut Marco's ringtone. Also, I'm curious, what does Helmut Marco have as a ringtone that's that distinctive? I'm hoping Barbie girl. Like, he is he still stuck in that naughty's vibe where... I know where he like ironically has Barbie Girl as his ringtone. It's Club Seven. No, I don't know. Or is he like me and that much of a nerd where he has the F1 theme song as his ringtone? Oh, the Moby one from the ITV, maybe. Ooh. <laughs> Perhaps he still has like a Nokia brick and just the the, the standard ringtone that he got with that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I wouldn't surprise me. That man is ancient. But equally, I reckon he's technologically advanced enough to have like an iPhone. So he's it's probably like <laughs> has one, doesn't know how to use it. Yeah, that's why it's gonna be stuck on like the basic iPhone ringtone. So it's gonna be he like still hasn't ringtone. unlocked it. Yeah. If you know what Helmut Marco uses as a ringtone, write into us at um at undercut podcast on Twitter. If you want to suggest Instagram. what Helmut Marco's ringtone is, also write to us. <laughs> yes. If you have any better suggestions as to what it should be, let us know. Um the uh just the Austrian or Dutch national anthem. Yeah, Austrian national Austrian. anthem, which Don't. I genuinely am beginning to sort of be able to sing along to at this <laughs> point, like recognise the melody and dee, 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 dee. And that's the Italian national anthem, which is so deeply ingrained in my soul. But every time it plays, it's sort of like being a sleeper agent, just sort of triggered by the Austrian national anthem going. Yeah, except that one doesn't wake you up. That sets you back to sleep again. <laughs> goes, oh, 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 I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> Anyway, we'll move on from all of that to declaring our winners and spinners from the Grand Prix. Timo, we'll open up with you and your winner, please. Amusingly, given my McLaren bashing earlier, I've got Piastri as my winner for this weekend. Um, P11 might not seem like much, but as a rookie in that McLaren, he's keeping out of trouble. He's not making many mistakes and he's showing a lot of potential. And as Brundle said on the commentary when Norris overtook him, that's just experience. There's not much nor, uh, not much Piastri can do about that. And he's just kind of going about learning his craft, keeping his head down and very close to the points. And it's a shame that he couldn't have been a little bit closer, but at the same time, it's nothing to be kind of shaking your head at either. So it's kind of a slightly left field choice, but I feel like he deserves a bit of a shout out. No, I can appreciate the left field choice of it. And I think he, he definitely had a drive worth praising. There was a lot of good stuff from it, a lot of good defensive work from more senior drivers coming from behind. So, And a couple of nice overtakes as well. Yeah, one worth giving a little nod of the head to. Ellie May, your winner. I've gone for the Ferrari strategists. Um, I was a bit dumbfounded during the race as I saw a successful Ferrari strategy unfold in front of my eyes. So... I mean, basically. Is, sorry to interrupt, but is it a successful Ferrari strategy, or is it qualifying badly means that if we f- start further back and finish fourth and fifth, that actually looks better than if we started fourth and fifth and finished fourth and fifth? Um, is it a reverse psychology thing? No, because they have. You think Charles Leclerc last in Spain he couldn't get back up there? So That's true. I, I'm essentially awarding them the bare minimum. I think. <laughs> Um, because they confused me that a whole entire race. I think firstly the fight between Perez and Sainz at the start. I don't know whether it was because Sainz was on mediums and Perez was on hards, but Sainz looked quicker than Perez and he outdragged him to the last chicane to overtake him without DRS because obviously it was the first lap. I'm sort of look, I'm sort of here thinking, 
what, what, why does this Ferrari look faster than that Red Bull? And then sort of on the lap 12-ish safety car comes out due to Russell hitting the wall and everyone that was on mediums apart from Ferrari pitted and it kind of made sense because they were stuck in a DRS train that started from Nico Hülkenberg in 7th and went down to Nick de Vries in 17th. So that way they were out of the train of cars to be then 4th and 5th and Sainz then pitted lap 38 and then or thereabouts Sharp pitted a lap later and they both maintained their positions and crucially they pitted after Perez who started on hard. They somehow made a one-stop work when everyone else did two, and they pulled enough of a gap on the first stint on the mediums to be able to maintain their race position and stay ahead of a Red Bull. And they were the also the only top four team to really have both drivers performing well in that race too. I'm confused. It is a weird one because, like you say, they didn't come in to pit at the same time everyone else did, and automatically you just slap your forehead thinking, oh, for God's sake, what have you done now, Ferrari? And then, like you say, you, you, you were thinking on lap 54, was it? Hang on, are they doing a one-stop? And you're like, wait a minute, have you done something smart? You know what? Good for you. You give a little hair tussle. And I was like, what, what, is, what is this going on here? It's, it's a, is this a one-off thing? Because, I mean, Austria next time, I think, is... Oh, no, okay, we've got Silverstone still for them, but we've got two races now where it's this time last year was their last kind of good stuff coming. And I hope this isn't the same case this year because I'd like this to be maybe the reverse of that and we start seeing a bit of a, a back... Kind of like they're doing the reverse last year. We have a terrible start and we'll kind of go back to having a, a, a better second half of the season and maybe maybe if we're going to dare to dream a little bit, which will probably get crushed immediately for this, but this is the tease that we need for that. And as well, because Ferrari are usually the hardest on their tyres. I know Canada isn't sort of that high in degradation, but I just want to know how they did it. Because how have they gone from... So would they. (laughs) How have they gone from a sort of a high degradation car to a car that lasted longer than everyone else? Or tyres that lasted longer than everyone else? And they were doing it quickly. Mm. And Tony, yeah, T- Giovinazzi just brought along some of that Le Mans charm and just went, look, I know I've seen F1 strategies, I've seen Ferrari strategies work. Here's what we need to do, boys. Because walks up Charles, like talking as someone who's one third of the way to the triple crown, I might have a thing or two to say here that you don't. And Charles, like, I'll just shoot me already. <laughs> yeah, I love the fact that Giovinazzi is one step close to the triple crown than Charles Leclerc is at this point. Just, oh, my long head boy. Um Nico Hulkenberg. So is Nico Hulkenberg, yes. Like you keep liking to mention. <laughs> and Alonso, who's... Alonso's never won around Monaco, though, is he? No. No, but he has won Le Mans. So, yeah, interesting. Um, anyway, so that's your winner then, Ellie May. You're the Ferrari strategist for simply doing the bare minimum of not being terrible. Yes. It's the, it, Again, 2023 is not a great season of Formula 1. <laughs> What I will say is, though, it has given me some food for thought on the grounds of if we were to start doing merch, little enamel pins of like awarding a winner and spin, like a winner's rosette and some sort of spinner's badge, I think would be quite funny. Um, Don't say that too loudly. You'll give F1 ideas and there'll be even more terrible tat on the poaching for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like they go along and they find Logan Sargent each week and give him like a little pin badge just going, oh, sorry, spinner this you week. You finished this race. <laughs> Congratulations, you did. Here's the bare minimum enamel pin badge. Um, oh, that, oh, no, I won't say that out loud on the podcast. Um, <laughs> but that one's, that one's for the group chat. Um, my winner is Alex Albon. I've already mentioned it. I've waxed lyrical about it. Uh, God tier drive. And also, did anyone see him and his girlfriend Lily getting interviewed after the race as well? That was mm-hmm. just adorable. Her birthday weekend, just nice to see. It, it, it's just nice. I just like having nice things every now and then. And he did well. He earned it. He deserved it and was really having to ask a lot of that car in those final sectors because that Alpine was in a better condition, in slightly warmer conditions, probably going to have gone past. But I think that Williams just had enough speed down the straights to hold on to things. And uh, if we had a few more turns and twisty bits, I reckon the Alpine would have probably snuck past. So decent job there from Albon. Um, we'll go to spinners then and we'll go back to Timo for this one Perez for me 
because I just guess he doesn't want to win anymore. Uh, he's the only person on the grid, weirdly, who is able to do anything about Max Verstappen this year because he's the only one who's got a car capable of it. And uh, despite knowing how to drive early on in the season, he seems to have either contracted kind of Mark Webber and anyone who's Max Verstappen's teammate syndrome and automatically is just suffering as a result of that and isn't allowed to do well, or he's just forgotten how to drive. And it's three races in a row now where it's just been, you're meant to be the king of street circuits and this is what you're doing. It just, it's a shame because it's the only kind of, we genuinely thought for a five glorious seconds there that we might actually have a championship battle on our hands. And he decided to take that really personally for some reason and shoot himself in the foot. So, um, yeah, god awful. I mean, I know it's P6, but you're in a Red Bull, for Christ's sake. It should be P2 at least. When you look at the dominance that Verstappen's extracting... He's laughing going over a curb saying he nearly knocked himself out and Perez can't even get a P2. No excuse. I mean, Perez hasn't been on the podium since Miami, and Verstappen's been leading every lap since Miami. I think that's that's where there's been a huge divergence in their race results. Um, yeah, one just, of these things is not like the other. Yeah, I was sort of thinking today whether it was sort of a case of um, sort of like a few years ago in that uh, the Mercedes was an excellent car to be out in front, but really struggled behind another car. But then I thought. Then you remembered about Max. Which happened <laughs> come up from the sort of, what was it, seventh, eighth, ninth or something in Miami, did it again as well in Saudi Arabia. And he got, he was in the lead by like lap 25 both times. So it's not the car. Yeah, it was like, he was down in 15th or something to start the Miami, the Saudi Grand Prix. I think I should be able to pull the results up just ahead of me here. Let's have a quick Again, share. it's my... Once again, plug for Max to just be so dominant this year that he gets bored, retires until 2026 when he thinks there might be an actual challenge worth fighting for, and Perez gets the boot so we can have Ricardo and any driver from being Lawson, Sonoda, or someone else entirely in that second seat, and we actually get something interesting next year. Mm. Yeah, Max started the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix in P15, and uh, I don't think I've got a note saying when he got into the lead. Uh, pretty early on lap 25 uh, I think Charlie May was right there it's just unbelievable the form he's got the fact that yeah that car can overtake you think back to would have been 2020 when uh, we saw the Mercedes stuck in the midfield in Monza and that was the reason we ended up with one of those sort of chaotic wins was because the Mercedes just couldn't really fight through the field Bottas was really struggling and even Hamilton was finding it hard going to try and get the Mercedes anywhere near the front of the field and that's how he ended up with that weird um, Gasly science stroll podium because the Mercedes just couldn't work their way through the field, especially if it was warm. But the Red Bull doesn't seem to be suffering that ailment. So there's no excuse for Perez as such. Um, Ellie May, your spinner. I think it's a bit harsh to call him a spinner, but I've gone didn't for... didn't complete the rotation, yeah. No, but I have gone for George Russell. It's... It's more down to the fact that out of the top four teams at the moment, Mercedes are usually the one team that have got both their drivers up there consistently this season thus far. And considering George was running fourth, it's a lot of points for the team to lose out when the battle for second in the constructors is still a bit unknown. So to lose out on 12 points, that's quite a lot of points. I mean, I know they've got second at the minute, but it doesn't take much for Aston Martin to get back up there, or maybe even Ferrari. The one thing I will say on that one, yeah, Ferrari, that's funny. Uh, the one thing I will say on that one is that I think Mercedes will still, I don't think that's something likely that's going to repeat itself a lot. And if you look at the fight for second, Aston Martin are still driving with one hand tied behind their back regardless because they've got Stroll in the other car. And you look at the points difference between Alonso and him and how much is actually being contributed there. I think 12 points, it may seem like a lot, but I think that's because you're thinking of them fighting a team with two drivers. Yeah. Alonso's got to do a lot of legwork to really try and stay ahead of Mercedes. If, if this was whole. 2024 and it was the Aston Martin lineup of Fernando Alonso and Daniel Ricciardo, then I would agree. But we're not there yet. 
or even the Aston Martin lineup of Fernando Alonso and uh, Felipe Drogovic. Drogovic. Yeah, that would which be I would also be one. happy with. And I reckon that would be a very competitive lineup. But Stroll just doesn't seem to have gelled with it, and I don't think it helps that possibly Alonso is getting more from that chassis apparently, than it's actually there. Apparently, Stroll said that the, uh, the crowd was like having ninth gear in his car, which is probably why he was doing so badly because his car doesn't have ninth gear. Yeah, he so was just, just sort of wasn't working properly. Shifting up too soon wasn't getting the full acceleration. I don't know. Um, we're going for my spinner quickly, and I've gone for Kevin Magnussen actually for this one. It was just a bit of amateur hour fighting from him against De Vries and ruined what could have been a decent result for Haas, even if it was a little pointless. It's a chance to show the pace and developments. And equally, at the end of the day, I think that bottom end of the field is going to come to a count back and. You're going to need all the positions you can get, even if they are P11s and P12s. And he might have just uh, pissed one into the wind, battling against Nick De Vries in an Alpha Dowry. Uh, not his finest hour, I don't think. It was just no, a poor, poor form from Haas all over. Yeah, it was just a poor race from Haas completely. It's, um, it's... I mean, they pitted, I mean, they can't see into the future, but obviously they pitted one lap too early with Hulkenberg and Hulkenberg then never made it back up. I think at least one of their drivers could have got at least a point this this race and both of them failed to do so. Again, it's like I was saying before, they should be taking Leaf out of Williams book and just throwing some stuff at the wall to see what happens because you already know what you're going to do if you take the sensible route. You're going to still finish out of the points anyway, so you might as well try something a little balmy there. And they should have maybe done that with Kima considering he was further down the grid anyway, Hulkenberg was potentially their their main one to focus on, but you knew he was never going to finish in the top five, barring some crazy stuff at the start. Um, so why not throw Magnussen on a wild alternate strategy and see what happens? Worst that happens at the end of that is that you're exactly where you were going to be anyway. Mm, you just sort of, you've got to gamble it and see what happens. And instead they, if anything, just played it too safe for their own good. Um, we'll move on from our winners and spinners to other drivers that are worth a mention. And one that I've noted down was Esteban Ocon. I think I touched on it a bit when we were talking about the Albon battle. And just a really solid drive from him to chase down the battling packs ahead, get back into the points. And it wasn't as good a pit strategy as it could have been from Alpine. I think they were a little too preoccupied with trying to rectify Pierre Gasly's race at certain points. But Ocon managed to make it work and got the most out of it that was possible, got into the right position and held off a hard-pushing Norris behind, who was also on far, far younger tyres as well. Ocon's tyres were by no means as bad as Albon's, but they were still pretty dead by the end of the race. So the fact that he was able to keep... Norris behind in a race where the McLarens almost looked faster than the Alpines was a pretty good show. My, my only thing to counter that is, on the podium in Monaco, then can't overtake the Williams. I think this was very circuit dependent. I'm just I think saying. The Williams had its advantages in the right place to be able to defend against a middling car if it had been another car. I'm still surprised. The fact that you've also got to bear in mind that the Mercedes of George Russell couldn't get past the Williams. like Damaged Mercedes that kept going out of the dirty air because it would overheat and go kaboom if it stayed there too long. Yeah, which sort of puts it on Whereas par what's with our a excuse? Well, what part it's of his car was damaged? Chassis. No, but it's that argument of once you level that playing field, you can see exactly where where and why potentially that Williams was able to form the cue it did behind it. And... Yeah, I think ultimately it had just about enough of the right stuff in the right places to start forming that giant train of people behind him. And I think they certainly got well, lucky. have still been able to get past. Ultimately, at the end of the day, probably should have done. But also that Williams was just the right car for that circuit at that right point in time. And I think it also had the advantage of Alex Albon in it, who overtaking... Are you saying he's a better driver than Mr. Bernard on? I would possibly say as much. I would certainly say that defending is his strong suit more so than attacking. Alex well, no, I've defense. got attacking is like, to be fair. Yeah, mostly his teammates, um, all being attacked by Max Verstappen, but that's a different matter entirely. The fact of the matter is that Alex Albon is a really strong defensive driver. We never saw that so much as an offensive driver. That was why whenever he sort of never had a strong qualifying, we always sort of saw him struggle to work his way up the field in that Red Bull. But if he started at the front, he was often able to cling on to places a lot better than anticipated. So it's possibly more driver than anything else there. Has anyone else got a driver to chuck into that field of worth a mention? 
no, but I was just going to add that I think for some reason this circuit was just difficult to overtake on. No one really overtook. I mean, you think early on in the race when Nico Hulkenberg was in seventh, everyone was stuck in a DRS train down to 17th. So, you know, whoever was in eighth, would it have been awful? Is, is that the track or is that the cars being so bloody big and only able to get close but not quite there? Maybe it's because of all the rain, it was a dirty track, you go offline and it suddenly really hampers you. That was where I was going to go next as well, the fact that the track offline is incredibly green. There hadn't been a lot of, well, obviously Q3, FE3 had been all right-ish, but then obviously we had a huge deluge through the tail end of qualifying that basically reset the circuits. All of a sudden, you had no feeder series going around, just Ferrari uh, sports car series and... Formula Ford Canada, which is hardly one for sort of smearing rubber across the surface of the circuit. So you've got a very, very unrubbered in circuit that was ultimately not going to give fantastic racing and chances for overtakes. It just not had had anyway. I just hate blaming the tracks for it when it's the when I feel like it could be if they just designed the cars or used slightly different tire compounds or some kind of thing on that one. I feel like you could have had something something more exciting there. I don't like blaming the tracks. I don't like blaming the tracks either. I think, yeah, this would have been better had we had better cars, but we don't. So we just have to find excuses everywhere else. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't want to find excuses just... everywhere else. <laughs> Otherwise, every week we just keep going, oh, the cars are terrible, aren't they? Oh, the cars are terrible, well, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Well, it gets a bit repetitive for a podcast, and that's how you don't retain listeners. We'll move on to our next section, which is Constructors Countdown. There's a change at the bottom as Williams surge past an ailing Alpha Tauri. The Grove outfit now on three and a half times the points of the Fianza based team. Seven points plays two. Haas are just a point ahead of Williams despite what could have been a good weekend close to home soil. Alfa Romeo are just a point ahead, now leading Haas. The title battle for seventh in the constructors is a tight one at the moment. McLaren have a gap behind them in sixth on 17 points. Alpine bag a small haul this week from Ocon's efforts on 44 points. Not enough to trouble the Scuderia, but sufficient to ward off Woking for now. Ferrari have fourth very much to themselves, 22 points shy of Aston in third. Mercedes gap to the Silverstone team closes up with Alonso outscoring Hamilton and Stroll outdoing Russell this weekend. 15 points between the two now and out in front uh, with as much as mercedes ferrari and alpine combined plus a fastest lap it's red bull on 321 points hi jesse here just editing together this week's podcast and if you enjoy the fact that it's advert free why don't you help us keep it that way and give us a bit of money on our patreon just head to patreon.com forward slash undercut podcast where for one pound a month you can help support the show and stop us having to fill it with annoying little adverts we can't really give you anything for it we might even start reading out names at the end of each episode but other than that that's pretty much all we've got just please give us a little bit of money i guess Yes, that is how one of the championship standings is. But let's take a look at the rather more important one, the one that refers to our predictions of every Grand Prix weekend as they come and go. And it's been a pretty decent point scoring weekend for Ellie May and Timo. Three points apiece. Ellie May bagging them for a Verstappen pole and win and a Hamilton third place. Timo, meanwhile, also getting double points for the Verstappen pole and win. And surprisingly, is Albon top eight wild prediction? I got a surprise there when I saw that written in the notes because I couldn't remember predicting that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I hadn't looked at anything since we did the preview for Canada. Didn't look at anything at all to do with F1. I came back today, had a look at the notes. Oh, how did I do? Crikey, did I predict that? Excellent. That's what you've written down. Yeah. Say again. You weren't even here for the preview either. Um, maybe that's what I need to do. Yeah, just sort of stop coming on the podcast, give us your predictions, and it will be fine. Um, yeah, so you got three points there, and I got just two. Verstappen win and Alonso. Two more second. than normal. Two more than normal. Yeah, this really bucks my trend of um, pointless points. since <laughs> Miami. Yeah. So, uh, so you think you are Paris? Yes. But equally, Verstappen was very dominant this weekend. So I think it was just possibly blind luck that led me to getting some points this weekend. Um, Mm. Overall, the standings currently are Ellie May on 23 points, uh, Timo on 15, and me on 7. So Timo is now on double my point, over double my point score. Um, 
yeah, that's, that's not great, is it? I've almost got a race win. Yeah, very nearly the points of a race win, yeah. I've got um, third place. Excellent. <laughs> I, I've got oh, what's seven. That's like P six and a fastest lap, isn't it? P6 Just is get some more points, points and we can round it up to something. Four, P8 is two. It's a P7 and the fastest lap. It's there not you a go. combination you see often. <laughs> no, I'll give you that. It's not an often seen combination. The Fantasy F1 review. Timo, have you got this one ready to go? I do. For Canada, we had an interesting time up top because we had three teams in first place with 269 points each which was Alex H9V2 at Francisco Rhodes and Arg. Um, if we go a bit further down, which one of you is mid-bed racing? I feel like that's one of you. Yeah. That's Jesse. You did just jump EMT racing in this particular oh. race. 239 points puts you in P7 for the Canadian Grand Prix. EMT racing in P8 on 228 points. On the curbs, 13th place, unfortunately, 206 points. But, you know, can't have everything. Overall in the standings, you've got Arg leading the way with 2,381 points, Francisco Rovers second, 2,331, and Alex H9V2. Interesting reversal of the top three from Canada uh, with 2,330. And Midbeds Racing is ahead of EMT Racing in P8, though, not P7 this time, with 2,053 points, EMT Racing 2,022 points. You're falling behind a bit there. You need to, need to sort I that out. I still need to get rid of Nick de Vries and Valtteri Bottas. Actually, Bottas would have got me points. Maybe Nico Hulkenberg. I need to get rid of one of those. All Nick de Vries, I think, is the key there. To start <laughs> off with. Uh, on the curves is in 15th place with 1,718 points. I'm all right with that. Down at the very bottom of the grid, experiment underdog with 451 points. And please subscribe, it's just broken the 500 barrier, 502 points. Oh, hooray. That is fantastic news. Uh, BRT Yamaha, my other other team, still not doing very well. 1,143, I look at things. Uh, where are the podcast ones? Mention. Daddy's Cash is one of the podcast ones, as is. Like, uh, please subscribe. Daddy's Cash in 30th, not doing great there. We do have like a relatively decent one for the podcast floating around somewhere. Where is it? Scrolling. Are you sure it's our podcast? It is our podcast. Here it is. It's Mike Neck, Mike, My Neck, Mike Crack oh, yeah. in uh, 26. How did I forget that one? My Neck, Mike Crack, uh, 1,268 points season in 26 down this week behind. We were all on speed, but ahead of poor energy. So we're doing all right, I suppose, in the grand scheme of things. So if that's everything we've got to cover this week, it's time to wrap up. Uh, we'll be back in about a week's time with a preview for the Austrian Grand Prix. We're heading back to Europe to finish up a bit more of the European leg ahead of the summer break. And uh, yeah, heading to the Red Bull ring for what's almost certainly going to be non-stop three days of just listening to the Austrian national anthem. Oh, well. Uh, Demo, in the meantime, where can the people find you? You can find me over on Is It Fast on the Curbs, the Nitro RX podcast, which there is a very fun episode of that coming up because we've just got a new season of that starting and it's already just gone off the absolute chain. And Paddock's Rarity and, of course, Instagram. Excellent. Ellie May, where can the people find you? You can find me doing the graphics on our Instagram page or on our TikTok account. Very nice indeed. And if you want even more of me, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter as at Jesse on Cars. And you can also find me writing for Classic Car Weekly. If you're listening to this on the Wednesday after the Canadian Grand Prix, then you can pick up the latest issue, which has my write up from the London to Brighton in it. All the adventures of me in my little MG, having a good old time there. Um, I think that leaves us with everything to say, unless anyone else has any final points they want to throw out in the dying moments of the podcast. Shaking the head from team out a blank stare from Ellie May. That's all we've got time for this week. We'll be back for the Austrian Grand Prix. Mm-hmm.